929, the mo three most important numbers in the case, 9 minutes and 29 seconds, is how long that went on for half of that time uh, Mr. Floyd was unconscious, breathless, pulseless. You will see in the videos, ladies and gentlemen, that uh, Mr. Floyd from time to time was heaving up his right shoulder. There's a reason for that. Mr. Shoblin's on his left side, his back and his neck. He can't move that. His hands are behind his back. He's heaving up the right shoulder so he can get room for his rib cage to expand to breathe. Because at this point, you will learn he's pancaked with the heart pavement beneath him and Mr. Shobin on top of him. In order to breathe, you have to have room for the lungs to expand in and out. And you'll see Mr. Floyd doing his best to kind of crank his, his right shoulder up, having to lift up his weight and Mr. Shobin's weight on top of him to get a breath for as long as he could get a breath. And, uh, and you will see and hear more about that uh, during the trial. You will learn that a number of the bystanders there called the police on the police. Genevieve Hansen, the first responder, called the police on the police. You'll learn that Donald Williams, uh, the young man who's very vocal, security background, mixed martial arts background, saw the pressure that was put on the neck. He called the police on the police. But not only that, you're going to learn that there was a 911 dispatcher. Uh, her name is Jenna Scurry. Jenna Scurry is going to come to talk to you also. There was a fixed police camera that was trained on this particular scene and she could see through the camera what was going on. You would learn that what she saw was so unusual and for her so undisturbing, I'm sorry, so disturbing, that she did something that she had never done in her career. She called the police on the police, a 911 dispatcher. She called Sergeant David Plinker, who's gonna come in to testify. She called him to report what she saw because she found it just that disturbing. She will tell you that she felt that she saw a man literally lose his life. And uh, you will hear her testify. Now I wanna to talk to you a little bit about intent, that is, what our evidence is going to be uh, on the issue of intent. As I mentioned, we're going to show you that the use of force here was excessive and unreasonable. Uh, we're going to show you that it was not accidental in terms of what was happening there at the scene. Uh, that uh, what Mr. Chauvin was doing, he was doing deliberately. Now when we bring you the evidence of intent, it's not gonna come in like a sandwich board that has a front side and a back side. And the front side says, this is our evidence of intent. And the back side says, yeah, you saw it. Uh, we will bring it to you, ladies and gentlemen, through the totality of all of the evidence, looking at it all together. Uh, you will, for example, hear from Nicole McKenzie, the medical support uh, coordinator for the Minneapolis Police Department. She will tell you that the dangers of the prone position, putting people face down on the ground, have been known about in policing for over 30 years that they train officers on it. Uh, she will tell you that arrestees, citizens who are under arrest, should never be put in the prone position except only momentarily to get them under police custody or control to get handcuffs on them, but never left in that position. You will learn that Mr. Floyd was in handcuffs already, so they didn't need to put him on the ground to get him into, uh, uh, to get him under police control. And she will tell you that the reason that you don't put persons or leave them in the prone position that way, let alone with a man's body weight on top of them, let alone for nine minutes and 29 seconds, the reason you don't do that is because of the potential to obstruct the airways. You're also going to hear from Lieutenant Johnny Mercer, the Minneapolis Police Department Use of Force Training Coordinator. He's going to tell you about what training Mr. Chauvin had received. But he's also going to tell you uh, that he knows of no training that would suggest that kneeling on somebody's neck, as Mr. Chauvin was doing, was proper, according to Minneapolis Police Department uh, training. You will learn that officers are trained uh, to avoid putting pressure on areas that are above the areas of the shoulder on the spinal column, on the neck, on the head. And that uh, to do that is using deadly force because if you are putting pressure or blows in those areas, you run the risk of seriously injuring the person or potentially even killing them. It can be deadly force. 
And so they're trained not to do that. But above all, you know, they, uh, the police are trained in the side recovery position, that if you have to put somebody in the prone position to get them under control, you turn them over on the side as soon as possible so you don't obstruct their airways by having them on their stomach where the lungs can't expand with the chest, let alone having a weight on your back. You put them in the side recovery position right away. Um, and, uh, and you will hear all about turn- the importance of that. And we'll all obviously bring you the evidence of all of the warnings that Mr. Chauvin would have received, not just from George Floyd himself, from the calls and crying out by the bystanders, from the approach of the ambulance, uh, from the paramedics and so on, all of whom did their part uh, to encourage him to let up and to get up. You'll be able to consider that too under the umbrella of intent. Now I want to talk with you uh, a second about uh, the evidence on causation, the medical causation, in terms of what was happening to Mr. Floyd while he was there on the ground. Um, and if I had to give this part of the evidence, you're going to see a name, I would tell you that you can believe your eyes uh, that it's a homicide, it's murder. You can believe your eyes. And here's what you'll be able to see uh, for yourself. You'll be able to see every part of what Mr. Floyd went through, from him first crying out, from his effort to move his shoulder to get his breathing, to get room to breathe. You'll be able to hear his voice get deeper and heavier, his words further apart, his respiration more shallow. Uh, You'll see him when he goes unconscious. And you'll be able to see the uncontrollable shaking he's doing when he's not breathing anymore, the anoxic seizures from oxygen deprivation. You'll be able to see when he's going through agonal breathing the involuntary gasping of the body once the heart has stopped from oxygen deficiency. And you'll hear, uh, and are well aware when there was a loss of pulse, uh, you'll hear from a number of experts on the stand that putting a man in the prone position with handcuffs behind his back, somebody on his neck and back pressing down on him for nine minutes and 29 seconds is enough to take a life. You will hear that also. You're also going to hear from other experts who will point to the significant evidence of the excessive force that was put on Mr. Floyd's body. Uh, You'll be able to see, ladies and gentlemen, the road rash on the shoulders from where he's been pressed into the pavement from the weight on top that stripped off layers of the skin. The same with respect to knuckles on his hand when he's pressing up trying to get room to breathe. The damage to his nose when he pressed his face into the pavement to try to get room to breathe, ladies and gentlemen. You will learn that the last nine minutes and 29 seconds of Mr. Floyd's life, he was only alive for part of that, um, uh, that period of time, but it matches the patterns of somebody who dies from an oxygen uh, deficiencies. We'll be able to point to the video evidence you'll be able to see for yourself. You're also going to hear and see certain evidence of what this was not. This was, for example, not a fatal heart event. Uh, This was not, for example, a heart attack. Uh, You will learn uh, that there was no demonstrated injury whatsoever to Mr. Floyd's heart, as in a heart attack. Uh, You'll hear evidence that uh, Mr. Uh, Floyd had an artery in his heart uh, that was partially uh, clogged. Uh, You will learn that there was no damage to Mr. Floyd's heart from an inadequate blood supply, blood supply to his heart, uh, that there was no clotting in his heart. You will learn that the medical examiner, when he was examining Mr. Floyd's heart after he had died, uh, saw no injury, no evidence of heart injury, and it was so unremarkable he didn't even photograph the heart. You will learn that this was not what's called a fatal arrhythmia. Uh, that the heart beats rhythmically, and it, occasionally then the heart gets out of rhythm and out of rhythm the heart just may stop. In the case of a fatal arrhythmia, you're going to learn that when a person suffers that, they stop and they drop right there where they are. It's instant death. You'll be able to see for yourself that Mr. Floyd did not die in instant death. He died one breath at a time over an extended period of time. It does not at all look like the way that one dies from a fatal arrhythmia. It was instant death. And uh, this was not an instant death. You'll also learn, ladies and gentlemen, that 
George Floyd struggled uh, with an opioid addiction. He struggled with it for years. Uh, you will learn that he did not die from a drug overdose. He did not die from an opioid overdose. Why? Because you'll be able to look at the video footage and you see he looks absolutely nothing like a person who would die from an opioid overdose. You will learn that opioids are tranquilizers. And when a person dies from an opioid overdose, what do they look like? First and foremost, asleep, in a stupor. And they never come to again. And they simply pass away, opioid overdose. They're not screaming for their lives. They're not calling on their mothers. They are not begging, please, please, I can't breathe. That's not what an opioid overdose looks like. Now you will learn that Mr. Floyd had 11 nanograms of fentanyl in his system when he died and they may say that's a fatal amount. Well, what you have to learn is something about tolerance. So for a person who has never been exposed to opioids or fentanyl, that may be lethal for them. But for others, who have been struggling with it for years, then they have a different tolerance level. Uh, you will learn, for example, that 11 nanograms of fentanyl is in the range that you will find in people who might receive opioid for cancer pain, for example. Mr. Floyd had lived with his opioid addiction for years, and you can see on the video that his behavior is not consistent with somebody who dies of an opioid addiction. He didn't go into slumber, he was not non-responsive, uh, he was calling out for his life. He was struggling. He was not passing out. Now you're also going to hear from um, a forensic pathologist, uh, Dr. Lindsay Thomas. And what she does as a forensic pathologist, she studies body tissues on autopsy to try to determine the cause and manner of death. She did this over a 35-year career as a forensic pathologist. Over that period of time, she had done medical examiner, forensic pathology work, in some 37 Minnesota counties, of the 87 we have, seven counties in Wisconsin, she had done over 5,000 autopsies and determined cause and origin or manner and cause of death in thousands uh, of others. She's semi-retired now and uh, works as a consultant still in the field of pathology. She was one of the persons who helped to train the current Hennepin County Medical Examiner Dr. Andrew Baker when he was just getting started out in forensic pathology. Now here's where Dr. Baker and Dr. Thomas agree uh, as to the manner of Mr. Floyd's death and I will show you the findings from Dr. Baker. When he lists manner of death for George Floyd, homicide. Now, I want to explain to you that when he uses homicide, it's not the way that we use it here in the courtroom. When the medical examiner says homicide, it simply means that the person died at the hands of another, is what that means. And I will show you what list that's chosen from in just a minute, and Dr. Thomas will come in and testify about that. But it means that he died at the hands of another. But you'll also learn uh, that he listed a cause of death. Cardiopulmonary arrest, complicating law enforcement, subdual, restraint, and neck compression. Now, I'm going to translate that into English, and you'll hear this from Dr. Thomas. Cause of death, cardiopulmonary arrest. Uh, what you're going to learn is that every human being that's ever been on the planet has two things in common with every other human being. Number one is that they are born, and number two is that they die a cardiopulmonary arrest. Because all the cardiopulmonary arrest means is that the heart stops and the lung stops is simply another way of saying death. So, cause of death, death. Complicating, that is involving law enforcement, subdual, that is subduing George Floyd, restraining him and compressing his neck under cause of death. And then how the injury occurred, decedent, George Floyd, experienced a cardiopulmonary arrest while being restrained by law enforcement officers. Now in terms of the manners of death, where well, you see here it says homicide, here, here would be the standard list of the choices that medical examiners will look to in determining what the manner of death was. How the injury or disease leads to death as manner of death, and this is Dr. Thomas will talk to you about this. Five manners of death. Natural. Natural causes. A heart attack is a natural death, you will learn. 
A fatal arrhythmia is a natural cause of death, you will learn. Accident. A drug overdose is an example of an accidental death, uh, for example. A car accident can be an accidental death. Suicide. Homicide, which is when they chose death at the hands of another, or undetermined, that if you can't tell which it is or what it is, you indicate undetermined. And here you will learn that Dr. Andrew Baker and Dr. Thomas determined amongst these possible manners of death, it wasn't natural, not accidental, not suicide, not undetermined, it was homicide, uh, death at the hands of another. But that's not all that Dr. Thomas is going to tell you. She's going to tell you something about the limitations of pathology, that is looking at the tissues of persons after they have been deceased and trying to determine whether somebody died as a result of oxygen deficiency, their limitations. Because in over half the cases where somebody dies from insufficient oxygen, and when you know they died from insufficient oxygen, there are no signs in the body tissues. She would give you the example, for example, of somebody who's smothered by a pillow and they die that way. She said, you may see nothing in the body tissues, but you know they died from oxygen deficiency because you know how they died. And uh, here in this case, you will hear that on autopsy, they didn't see any objective things in George Floyd's tissues, but she says we have to look at all the evidence and we can see what happened at the scene. And, uh, and we can see moment by moment uh, that he had all the telltale signs of a person who's struggling and suffering uh, from not receiving sufficient oxygen. She will say you have to look at all the evidence and we'll show you that objective evidence as we go through. So finally, uh, I want to talk to you about some of the evidence that you will hear, some of the facts uh, that do not excuse uh, this excessive use of force, but you will hear about them. We will tell you about them. Uh, for example, you will hear that George Floyd was a big guy. He was over six feet tall. Every uh, police conduct witness we bring to you on the stand, every use of force expert will tell you that his size is no excuse for uh, any police abuse. You're gonna hear obviously that he struggled with drug addiction, that he had high blood pressure, they'll talk about heart disease, um, and we will tell you about that uh, heart disease uh, that he had. What you will learn is, is that George Floyd years for, lived for years, day in and day out, every day, with all of these conditions until the one day on May 25th when he ended the nine minutes and 29 seconds and that was the only day he didn't survive. That he went into that circle of nine minutes and 29 seconds is the only day he didn't come out again. Uh, you will learn that. It's not an excuse for what happened in the nine minutes and 29 seconds. You will hear what happened earlier on the day on May 25th. Uh, you will be able to see how the police approached him in his vehicle over the fake $20 bill. You'll be able to see how when they approached his car, came to his window within seconds, they had pulled out their gun, were pointing it at his head, and were using the foulest of language. You'll be able to see them uh, get him out of his car, put him right away in the handcuffs. You'll see them pat him down so that they know he doesn't have any weapons. And not only that, you'll be able to hear uh, George Floyd when he approaches the squad car saying he is terrified to be put into that squad car, you hear him say, I think I'm gonna die if they put me in there. I think I'll die if I'm put in that squad car. He was terrified, you hear him talk about that. He says he was claustrophobic. And then he asked to count himself. Let me count my way into the squad car. And he starts trying to count one, two, up, the manhandle him, shove him into the car with the handcuffs on, and you'll see how he freaks out. Uh, from that. Uh, you hear him saying, I can't breathe in the back of the squad car, and we will show you in the back of the squad car where Mr. Chauvin at one point had his hands around Mr. Floyd's neck in the squad car, and another, his arm and elbow around his neck with Mr. Floyd's uh, head here, when they were pulling him out of the squad car, putting him on the ground in the prone position, and when the nine minutes and 29 seconds begins. But you're also going to learn, ladies and gentlemen, at the time they put Mr. Floyd on the ground that way, there were five grown men, armed police officers who were on the scene over a fake $20 bill. There were five of them there. Mr. Chauvin and his partner, the two officers who had shown up there earlier in the first place before Mr. Chauvin was there, and a member of the park police. There were five there. 
uh, for a man who didn't threaten anybody, you will see committed no act of violence in any way, who didn't try to run away, and uh, who was put in the prone position this way with five grown men armed police officers present. None of that, ladies and gentlemen, we submit you will find uh, to be an excuse for what happened in the nine minutes and 29 seconds. We're also going to want you to learn uh, something about George Floyd, George Perry Floyd. His family members call him Perry because he was not simply just an object of the excessive use of force of police. He's a real person. And I want you to learn something about it. At the time that he was killed, he was 46 years old. He was a father, a brother, a cousin, a friend to many. He was originally from Houston, Texas, even before Houston. Uh, he was from my original home state, North Carolina. Uh, Fayetteville, North Carolina before Houston uh, is where his family was from. He excelled in basketball and uh, football. Loved shooting hoops even to the end and kept himself fit that way. He moved to Minnesota from Texas uh, for a fresh start. And the rest of this you learn about him. His work as a security guard, that he lost his job when COVID hit. He's a COVID survivor, uh, George Floyd was. And he lost his job as an employer, was forced to close uh, given COVID. But the point to all of this is that we want you to know something about who George Floyd was as a person. Because he was somebody to a lot of other bodies uh, in the world. So ladies and gentlemen, I'm uh, going to sit down in a moment this morning. Uh, we're going to show you through the evidence that there was no excuse uh, for the uh, police abuse of Mr. Chauvin. We're going to ask at the end of this case that you find Mr. Chauvin guilty for his excessive use of force against George Floyd that was an assault that contributed to taking his life and for engaging in imminently dangerous behavior, putting a knee on the neck, the knee on the back for nine minutes and 29 seconds without regard for Mr. Floyd's life. We're going to ask that you find him guilty of murder in the second degree, murder in the third degree, and second degree manslaughter. 